Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for a virtual town hall meeting to discuss our plans for welcoming you to campus for fall instruction at Michigan Technological University. We're excited to have you with us as we share the plans we're making to provide campus-based instruction in a safe and effective manner for everyone on campus. My name is Larkin Hooker-Marakey. I'm the president of undergraduate student government, and today I'll be serving as moderator for the meeting. The formal part of the presentation will last about 55 minutes, leaving about 30 minutes for question and answer. Several questions were submitted in advance. If you have questions during the session, please use the Q&A feature available to you on the Zoom interface. I will do my best to field these questions to the appropriate individuals on our panel. We may not be able to answer all of the questions posed today. This event is being recorded. If you lose connection or would like to watch it again or share with others, the session will be posted to the MTU Flex page on Monday. One of the topics that will be discussed in the presentation today is personal protective equipment. As you can see, none of us are currently wearing face coverings, and this is because we are in individual offices with doors closed. We will, we will be reviewing most of these requirements and some of the nuances such as this during today's town hall. I'd now like to introduce our panelists joining us from campus. Jackie Huntoon, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Bonnie Gorman, Dean of Students and Vi Vice President for Student Affairs. Joe Cooper, Director of Financial Aid. Teresa Coleman-Kaiser, Associate Vice President for Administration. Sarah Schulte, General Counsel and Secretary to the Board of Trustees. She has also been leading our MTU Flex Return to Campus team. I'd now like to turn it over to President Kobach to get us started. Thanks, Larkin, and thanks for joining us today during our town hall. As you can imagine, there's been lots of planning going on here on campus in preparation for your return, and you're going to hear a lot of details over the next 55 minutes. But I just wanted to take a moment and talk to you briefly about the three fundamentals that we used in developing these plans. The first is accommodations. We realize that there are those identified by the CDC that may be in particularly high risk categories for the effects of COVID-19. And you hear about accommodations that we're putting in place, whether you are subject to those or someone you live with, such that you can study remotely or if you're an employee, you can work remotely. The second is adjustments to nearly every process that we have on campus. You're going to hear about the social distancing. You're going to hear about the dining changes. You're going to hear about classrooms being smaller. You're going to hear about some of your classes being hybrid. Lots of activity there, but those are all adjustments that we put in place to try and minimize the risk of COVID impacting our campus in a negative way. And the third is agility. You'll also hear about the MTU flex plan and our ability to move up or down with regard to the remediations that we need to put in place. And if we get to a point that we can't continue on campus, that we're ready to make that change as well. So we're proud of the MPU Flex Plan and all the planning that has been done. All of this is done with two primary goals. The first and foremost is your safety when you return to campus. That's been central to the entire conversation that we've had over this summer. But the second is to do our best to protect the Michigan Tech Husky on-campus experience that we want you to have while you're here. And with that, I'll turn it over to the panelists. And the first panelist is our provost, Dr. Jackie Huntoon. Great, thanks President Kobach. Okay, I want to start talking a little bit about some of the constraints we've had controlling our planning for fall semester. So as President Kobach mentioned at the very start, safety is our first consideration. And so we're going to be asking anybody who comes to campus, be it faculty, staff, or students, to be smart and do their part to help protect the health and safety of everybody else in our campus and local community. The first thing that we're going to be doing is asking everyone to maintain to the maximum extent possible six foot physical distancing between individuals. We'll also be asking everyone to, fear, 
to wear face coverings. Typically, these will be masks. Whenever they're indoors in any area that is not within a closed office with the door closed, a single person being there. So whenever you're in a building here at Michigan Tech in fall semester, you will be asked to wear a face covering unless you're in your own personal isolated space. So we want everybody to know that that's a requirement coming out and faculty will be prepared to enforce that in the classroom if necessary. We're also going to be asking everybody to engage in frequent hand washing. Um, we know that's one of the best ways to control the spread of any disease. So it's something we should all do frequently anyway. We'll be working with our facility staff as well as all members of the campus community to make sure that we clean any shared surfaces frequently. And we all need to take personal responsibility for making sure we clean things before and after we use them again to help reduce the transmission of any diseases. We'll be asking people to monitor their symptoms. This is very easily done. Many of us has, have been doing it for most of the summer for whenever we go to campus. And it's a way to remind yourself to keep track of your health and keep track of how you're feeling and to think twice about going out in public if you think you might either have the disease or have been exposed to the disease. To that end, as well as we have a um, very comprehensive testing and contact tracing plan in place so that if someone does think they're ill, they can get tested right here in our local area. We're working with local medical providers as well as laboratory facilities here on campus to make sure the testing is done as quickly as possible. And should a positive test arise, we're prepared to do the contact tracing that's necessary to find out who else may have been exposed. Should someone think they were exposed or actually have been exposed, we will have facilities available on campus for those students who live on campus for quarantine and isolation. And we'll make sure that those students are well cared for by they are isolated from the rest of campus. And finally, actually, as um, President Kovac already mentioned, we will be able to make accommodations for students who are particularly high risk. We've already done this for a number of our faculty and are doing it for a number of our staff. So what are the implications of all of those safety measures? Well, the first implication is that some courses are moving to either a remote or online mode to improve their quality. Um, some of the people who taught remotely during spring semester when we rapidly had to transition to remote learning from face-to-face -face learning found that their courses actually were more effective, students were more engaged, and they felt that the material was addressed in, with higher quality after they moved to remote instruction. And that's because it gave students the opportunity to interact with the material in new and different ways that maybe they haven't tried before, as well as to be sure and give some of the students who might be shy about speaking up in class the opportunity to contribute to classroom discussions via Zoom. Um, some of our classrooms are going to have reduced occupancy limits because of the physical distancing requirement. So, for example, our largest classroom on campus is Fisher 135, and pre-COVID-19, it had a capacity of about 475 students. Now, with all of the requirements that we put in place, it will have a capacity of 75 students. So that classroom clearly can't accommodate as large a class as it was in the future. Some of the classes that were in a room like that have been moved to remote instruction or online instruction. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference between those two in a minute. Others will continue to have some face-to-face -face component. However, in some cases, not every student will be able to attend every single face-to-face -face class. So some will be there right in the classroom with their faculty member, while others will be participating from a different location. We talked about, and you may have heard about, having increased time between classes to allow for people to move from point A to point B without crowding or without having people trying to get into and out of a classroom at the same time. For the moment, we've decided to leave the time between classes as it has been, which means 10 minutes, but we are open to changing that in the future should the need arise. So some classroom activities are going to move online also so that we can maxi maximize the use of high demand spaces 
such as labs, for the activities that really make the best use of those spaces. Next slide. So um, I really want to call out all of our faculty and staff who have worked amazingly hard since COVID-19 first disrupted our campus activities. Um, we all knew that the challenge was really to take everything that we do here on campus normally in a face-to-face -face way at specific times in the day to a new mode. And in some cases, that new mode is something we're referring to as remote learning. And remote learning is basically synchronous learning, meaning that it happens at agreed upon times. So even though people might not all be physically in the same location, they are meeting together at the same time, much as we're doing right now. In addition to that, some courses went fully online because that's what the students wanted. And online courses are those that are offered asynchronously, meaning that people can interact with the material or the course at any time that they want. So the, the biggest challenge facing the faculty over the summer was figuring out how to take everything we do on our campus and make it possible to do those things in either remote or asynchronous. And for everything that we will be doing face-to-face -face on our campus, we're also going to have the ability to do those at least remotely and possibly asynchronously and online. So the reason we're putting so much emphasis on this is, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the fall. We're all watching what's happening around the United States right now. And, you know, I think we have to agree that it's possible, not desirable, but possible that one of our students will either be exposed to this disease or fall ill from this disease at some point during fall semester. So we're really trying to do everything to make sure that no one's educational process is disrupted as a result of that. And so if you can't attend in person because you think you've been exposed or you've tested positive, that's okay. You're gonna be able to continue on with your education. You won't have to drop your courses. You can just continue on whether you're engaged in things like enterprise or senior design, other research projects, whether or not you want to visit your advisor and get some advising um, from your dorm room, let's say, or your off-campus apartment, or visit with your faculty member through office hours. So, you know, congratulations to our faculty for thinking this through and making this happen. Um, it's really been an amazing feat. Next slide. So, when we first started talking about TechFlex, um, there was a lot of question, like, can this even be done? Can we say we're gonna offer face-to-face -face education and at the same time offer an equivalent experience to students who need to attend remotely because of health concerns? And what was really great to find was that when we were forced to do this without any notice whatsoever in spring semester 2020, 55% of the instructors who were teaching during spring semester were cited by at least one of their students for doing an excellent job of moving their face-to-face -face course into a remote learning experience. And that means that 373 unique individuals were cited by at least one student. That's actually a phenomenal achievement. We learned some things. We issued a survey to students at the end of spring to say, hey, what worked really well? We also asked what, asked what didn't work so well, so we can try to work on those shortcomings. But what we learned was students really appreciated having access to recorded lectures, so they could engage with the material asynchronously. They liked having the opportunity to engage with faculty during virtual office hours, um, usually using Zoom. And they really appreciated the fact that faculty tried to provide individualized support and feedback despite the distances between students and faculty. Next. So as I said, we did pretty well. We actually, we did really well in spring semester, but we're really working hard to do better for the fall. And so prior to the COVID-19 disruption in spring semester, only 25% of our faculty had received the professional development or training that we normally require for someone to teach online or remotely. By the start of fall 2020 semester, that percentage goes up to 84%. 
And the University Senate has been a great partner to the University Administration on this, sort of reaffirming the importance of this professional development so that we can do as good a job as possible with instruction. We've also asked students to do some preparations. We learned um, during the spring that the students who were most successful, successful had access, dedicated access to some sort of computing device, such as a laptop, that included a camera and a headset so that they were able to interact with their classmates and their faculty at any time they wish to do so. So we are asking students to return to campus with a computing device. Typically, this will be some sort of laptop, including a camera and a headset. And the specifications for those are now available on Michigan Tech's website. Next. So with this slide, I'd like to introduce our Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Dr. Bonnie Gorman. Thanks, Jackie. I am just delighted that all of you were able to join us today, and I really can't wait to welcome you back to campus. Um, our intent in the town hall today is really to um, give you an overview. We're going to give you a lot of information, but in the next few weeks, we're going to be sending you information fairly consistently. So I encourage you to routinely check your email so that you can have up-to-date information on a regular basis. And finally, as a reminder, we have changed our calendar and classes are going to begin on Thursday, August 27th. And when you come to campus, things are going to look and feel a little bit different. And as the people who have already spoken said, safety is our highest priority. And we're going to expect you to do your part. That will begin with daily symptom monitoring. We will be launching a website on July 27th and be asking students to monitor their symptoms on a regular basis. We'd like you to begin doing this actually 14 days before you intend to arrive on campus. And of course, if you have any symptoms, we ask that you delay your return to campus. As Jackie indicated, everybody will be asked to wear face coverings in all indoor spaces and um, in outdoor spaces where social distancing cannot be maintained. You won't have to wear your face covering in your residence hall room or in your office if the door is closed. We are adhering to the physical distancing guidelines both in and out of class. And many businesses in town are asking people to adhere to these guidelines as well. And we ask that you follow their requests. This community is counting on all of us to help stop the spread. There is a testing program in place and Sarah's going to say more about that. I would simply ask that if you are asked to take a test that you would be willing to participate. This would be at no cost to you. We need to hold each other accountable. These are new things that we need to do every day and they take some getting, as, getting used to. I found myself on campus not having done my symptom tracker and I wasn't able to get into the building. My colleague forgot her mask one day and had to return home. So I encourage you to find someone, a buddy, to help you to remind each other to do these things on a regular basis so that they can become a habit. And we are Huskies after all, and a group of students have put together a pledge that we're inviting all students to sign. You'll be sent the link for this um, and more information will be coming, but we hope that you'd be willing to demonstrate your commitment to keep yourself healthy and to keep our community healthy. Next slide. For those of you who are living in the residence halls, in accordance with our public health guidelines, um, we will have two people in a room um, and you have been uh, moving, the move-in process will be a little bit different. Um, as returning students, you've been at sent an email and asked to sign up for a move-in time that is convenient for you. Uh, the goal here, of course, is to avoid um, lots of people showing up on the same day at the same time needing to use the same door. So we ask that you um, do that sign up um, and then adhere to the times that you, have follow, um, that, that you have requested. In addition, we're trying something new for those of you for whom it might be convenient. If you'd like to drop off your property in advance in order to avoid any kind of congestion, you can do that between July 31st and August 9th. And there'll be um, an email coming from housing about that sign up. 
Dining services will also be adhering to physical distance in the dining halls, and we will also be having grab and go available as well. Teresa is going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. In the common areas in the residence halls, you will be asked to wear masks and to practice the physical distancing guidelines. When the student staff come back, they will be trained with up-to-date information about COVID-19 and will provide support should you become ill. And as Jackie indicated, we do have isolation space identified for students who live in the residence halls. Dining services will be providing your meals um, and will be to have um, staff from the residence education office be checking on you on a daily basis. We do recommend that students pack an isolation kit um, these are some of the things that you might want to consider putting inside. We will be actually giving you two face coverings when you get to campus, but since we're going to be wearing them a lot, you may want to bring a couple of your own. Might need a thermometer to check your temperature um, or symptoms. Disinfectant wipes, I think this is something that we're all going to be carrying in addition to our water bottles and our phones. Any medications that you take on a regular basis. Clean clothes and some food staples, you know, those things you keep in your room anyway, like juice, tea, chicken, chicken soup, peanut butter, and crackers. And again, as I said, in the, for students who are from the residence halls, your meals will be delivered to you. I would actually recommend you throw a good book in there as well. Next slide. So what, does all, what do all these changes mean for student um, groups on campus? Student leadership and involvement has been working to put to get together guidelines for our student organizations. These guidelines will include information about how to um, host your events safely, meeting requirements that adhere to physical distancing, recommendations for congregate living houses, recruitment, and resources for successful virtual events. Student organizations will be required to um, adhere to the meeting size limitations, which is 50 people in a room with physical distancing. Travel is going to be discouraged. Obviously, we, if, we're, if we have a, a safe environment here and the virus is not present, we don't want to risk people going elsewhere and being exposed and bringing it back. We've been talking a lot about club sports and intramurals and the guidelines that are appropriate there. Obviously, we need to limit our high touch sports, limit competition, um, keep travel to a minimum. Many of the organizations like the rugby club, for example, have um, national associations and they have also put out guidelines. So we're looking at those as we make our recommendations going forward. And finally, I recommend that you think about your circle of contacts and keep them relatively small as much as possible. These could include your housemates, they could include people in the rooms around you, people from um, your, your teams or a work group or a Bible study. To the extent possible, avoid crowds, parties, and bars. Next slide. So some of the events that you normally see on campus will continue. Welcome week um, will still happen. We'll still distribute the binders that we distribute every year. We'll provide some snacks for you. We'll be handing those out, you know, kind of at a distance and you can pick it up. Um, K-Day will be virtual this year, um, but we will be hosting in-person interest fairs. So for example, we may have all the club sports out on one day in the afternoon and, and students will be able to interact um, in a smaller group with sports and activities that they might be interested in. Pretty excited actually about moving the career fair um, online. I know um, at first it seems a little unusual, but uh, we do have a platform that we're able to use. And instead of one long afternoon with long lines, this format will actually afford students the opportunity to sign up for a time with employers that they're interested in. And we'll be doing this over a two day period. Career Services is ready to provide the same kind of preparation for the virtual career fair that they would provide for the in-person career fair. And those resources and presentations will be available both in person in smaller groups and uh, online. Our Parade of Nations will be interactive. We will be missing the food, I have to say. 
um, but students will have the opportunity to travel around the world without leaving Houghton. And last but not least, athletics. We've had a lot of questions about that, and we're still actually waiting for more guidance from the NCAA. Right now, we're following the governor's recommendation, which indicates that there can be 500 spectators at an outdoor event and 250 at an indoor event. So this is what we're working with currently, but by the time various seasons start for different sports, this of course could change. Next slide. Of course, there are numerous resources available on campus. Counseling services is available to you. And if you're not sure where to go, you can always come to the Dean of Students office or reach out to us via email. I wanted to list the healthcare um, providers that are available in the area. We're working closely with the Upper Great Lakes Family Health Center um, for our testing program. And if that would be a provider that you are comfortable using, we would encourage you ahead of time to go online and complete their patient portal. Should you need their services, that will speed up um, the, oppor the opportunity to, to get seen and to get the information back. And I wanna to mention too here that you should check your personal insurance plans. Sometimes you just wanna have someone to consult with and more and more insurance companies are making telehealth available um, and making nurses available for those conversations. So you might wanna check and see what's available to you that way. Again, thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you in the fall and I'm gonna turn it over now to Teresa Coleman Kaiser, Associate Vice President for Administration. Thank you, Bonnie, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad that you've joined us this afternoon to hear about our planning for the fall semester. I wanna share some information about how we've planned to have our custodial staff significantly redirect their effort to focus on regularly sanitizing high frequency touch points, such as water fountains, doorknobs, light switches, and elevator buttons throughout all campus buildings. The staff will be using disinfectants approved by the EPA to kill the coronavirus as they regularly clean classrooms and restrooms and hit those high frequency touch points. I'd like you to know that this cleaning may occur overnight, so you may not personally observe the custodian doing this cleaning, but it will be done regularly. Sanitizing frequently will be significantly increased. However, I'd like to remind you that you should always treat any surface as having the potential for harboring the virus and take steps to protect yourself. Campus buildings are being prepared now with directional signage to indicate traffic flow and to remind you to physically distance. Hand sanitizer will be provided throughout buildings and frequent hand washing is encouraged to protect yourself and others. In the classroom, you will see instructional personnel doing their part by wiping shared equipment and demonstrating personal protection by bringing their own markers and erasers to eliminate sharing. Specifically for those of you living in the residence halls, bathrooms in WADS, DHH, and McNair will be cleaned twice a day, seven days per week, which is at a higher frequency than our previous practice and as recommended by the CDC and the American College Health Association. Other residence hall spaces such as kitchenettes and meeting rooms will be cleaned by staff, but also stocked with a supply of cleaning products and standard instructions to assist everyone in maintaining a healthy environment. If you live in a location where you're responsible for your own cleaning, such as the Daniel Heights apartments or an off-campus apartment, we suggest frequent wiping of all high frequency touch points and regular bathroom and kitchen cleaning. Creating an agreed upon schedule with your roommates and making the schedule visual is highly recommended. I've received quite a few inquiries about ventilation in campus spaces. I want you to know that Michigan Tech will be following best practices and using engineering controls to increase the volume of outside air moved through buildings and will be maximizing the effectiveness of air filtration systems. I'm going to move to the next slide and I'm also glad to share some information with you about what dining services will look like across campus as well as in the residence halls. All dining services at Michigan Tech will operate under any executive order that is currently in place and leans heavily on the local health department, the CDC, and the National Restaurant Association for operational guidance. 
we plan to allow as much in-house seating for dining as possible, but expect that to be at a reduced capacity. Cleaning and disinfection in all dining operations will continue to be the highest priority. And as required, we will be logging the frequency of cleaning and sanitation efforts. For retail dining on campus, we plan to have the North Coast Grill and Deli, the Library Cafe, Fusions, and the Campus Cafe open for the start of fall classes. You will see changes made to the furniture arrangements, queuing, cashiering, and pickup areas to indicate physical distancing. We will also be encouraging you to use an, an electronic pre-order and payment system that we will be rolling out. In our residence halls, in the dining halls, similar to what you might have experienced in the spring, we will again be using an electronic sign up and order system for takeout meals to manage our throughput. And we are happy to be able to supplement takeout meals with in-house dining to the capacity allowed. And we will be managing in-house seating through an electronic sign up system as well. As usual, students will be allowed to utilize any of the three dining halls, and you can look forward to extended dinner service hours at Wadsworth Hall serving until 7.30 p.m. And then for student organizations, catering services will be available, offering a limited menu, and will be bound by the occupancy limits of any space on campus. Catering staff will be available to consult with students to meet their needs. Lastly, I'm going to share some information about student employment. We have to acknowledge that student employment is an important element of a student's campus experience and their ability to pay for their education and living expenses. As a recap of student employment from the spring semester, you may not know that the university quickly stood up a temporary employment program called the Husky Worker Ready Program, which helped um, which was in place for about three months uh, in the spring semester. Husky Worker Ready helped approximately 55 students continue working during the stay home, stay safe order and paid out about $75,000 in student wages. On campus student employment looks promising for the fall with many university services reopening. Students who are planning to return to an on-campus position should be in touch with their supervisor about what the role will look like for the fall and whether or not the position will be virtual or in person. If you're looking for campus employment, the best source for student employment information is Handshake, which contains listings for open on-campus and work study jobs, as well as those available at local businesses. You can navigate to Handshake on the Career Services website. And if you don't see what you're looking for now, please check back closer to the start of the school year, as many positions are not posted until closer to the start of the fall semester. Once the semester starts, Career Services will be hosting a virtual on-campus jobs expo to help students learn about open job opportunities on campus. If you are a student employee and have a concern about performing your job duties, accommodations will be provided for employees identified by the CDC as being at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 and those who are caring for someone at risk as requested. Student employees can request a COVID-19 high risk accommodation or an accommodation for any other reason, such as being medically unable to wear a face covering by contacting the Michigan Tech ADA coordinator. At this time, I'd like to hand the conversation over to Joe Cooper, Director of Financial Aid. Thanks, Teresa. Um, I wanna begin by emphasizing that our Financial Aid Department is here to help for any questions and concerns that you may have during these times. Um, we are here to help and our contact info is on the screen there. So first I wanna talk a little bit about the funds that were allocated to Michigan Tech from the Federal CARES Act. As I know many of you have had questions about this and I've actually talked to many of you about this as well over the last few weeks. Um, so approximately $4.6 million was allocated to Michigan Tech from the Federal CARES Act. Now, $2.3 million of this, or half of it, was designated to help offset the additional expenses and the loss of revenue that Michigan Tech incurred as a result of COVID-19. With this funding, as well as the other proactive measures that President Kobach and his team 
um, put in place, the goal has really been to avoid passing on additional COVID related expenses to the students, to you. The other half of that funding, the $2.3 million, is required by the federal government to be dispersed directly to you, the students, as emergency grants. Specifically, this does need to be related to expenses due to the disruption of campus operations as a result of COVID-19. Now, the federal government has their own specific criteria for how a student is deemed eligible for these funds. And it's important to note that that criteria, that guidance has been continually evolving ever since the CARES Act was first announced. And that's something that Michigan Tech, uh, my office, President Kobeck's office, we've all been monitoring that very closely throughout this whole time to make sure that we're compliant with the US Department of Education and their regulations that they put forth. Um, as of today, I'm happy to say that we've been able to distribute $350 emergency campus disruption and technology grants to more than 4,000 students um, that are eligible. Many of you have actually likely already received these funds just within the last day or two if you have direct deposits set up. In addition to this emergency grant, I do want to talk about a couple other resources that are important to note. You may remember back in March when Dean Bonnie Gorman emailed you back at the end of the month and she included some additional resources in that email that I think are really important and that many of you already did take advantage of and we're glad those were there. The Betty Chavis Emergency Fund, the International Student Emergency Assistance Fund, and the newly created Husky Emergency Assistance Fund are all forms of emergency financial assistance that students students can apply for through the Dean of Students website. Also, I do want to note that, you know, you can always contact our office in financial aid by sending us an email uh, to inquire about a special circumstances review if your family's income has drastically changed since submitting your FAFSA, your free application for federal student aid. Um, a few quick reminders about that FAFSA. It's not too late to submit that, first of all. Um, you still have time to complete that up until and even after the start of the school year. It's a great way to maximize the amount of financial aid that you could be eligible for. Also, if you were selected for verification documents, definitely try to get those to us as soon as you can. We wanna make sure all your aid is finalized before you get to Michigan Tech and before classes start. If you're not sure about that, you can go to your My Michigan Tech page and click on the financial aid tab. And then also, if you're considering taking out student loans, whether that be federal or private or alternative loans, try to have those confirmed and completed by August 1, just so we can make sure that we get those and have everything in place by the time school starts. Um, otherwise, I, I just really want to emphasize that, you know, we understand that you probably have a lot of questions as a result of the COVID-19 situation, and we're very much here to help as a resource, so please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Schulte, our general counsel, who, as Larkin mentioned earlier, has been working really hard to um, get us this complete return to campus plan with a pretty comprehensive team. Thank you. I appreciate that, Joe, and, and to everybody else who's spoken today. This really has been a team effort doing all the work that's been going on this summer to get all of you back to campus in the fall and to keep you here safely throughout the fall semester. In addition to the people speaking here today, there have been some really key players in this effort. Kelly Cam, who is an associate professor in KIPP and an epidemiologist, has been working really hard on our testing program and our contact tracing program. Dr. Zach DeYoung at Upper Great Lakes has been an instrumental partner for helping us do this planning and the testing program that we're going to be partnering with them on. Um, and everyone at the Western UP Health Department has been involved in this process and has been really integral um, in our planning. So our thanks to them and we're all working really hard to get you back here. Um, when you return to campus, this is new, right? These health and safety levels are how we are going to be approaching COVID-19. So the health and safety levels were developed really to maximize your educational experience on campus while allowing the flexibility to respond in real time to what's going on with COVID. I think we have all learned that the situation with COVID rapidly changes, that now that we're in July, we don't know exactly what the situation will look like in August or September or October or November. Um, so making decisions now that are absolute for that period of time probably doesn't make that much sense. So this health and safety level plan allows us the flexibility to respond in real time and take appropriate action as it is determined. Um, you'll see that, you know, level one is kind of the least restrictive level. They ramp up to level five that is the most restrictive level. We expect to be bringing you back at level three, absent things changing, which they always could. 
but we expect to be bringing you back at level three. Level three involved this, involves this mixed modality instruction that you've heard talked about um, today. So that's a mix of face-to-face -face and remote instruction for most of you, some online instruction. Face coverings, as you've heard, will be required indoors and outdoors where six foot distancing cannot be maintained. That's also true at level two and at level four. So really plan on face coverings. Everyone coming to campus, that's students, that's employees, all the faculty, all the staff, and visitors will be asked to do daily symptom monitoring while we're at level three. That's something that we're gonna ask you to get accustomed to. We've all been working to get accustomed to it over the past several weeks. We're getting better at it. We know it takes a little adjustment, um, but it does really help keeping our campus safe and that's very important. Uh, we will have a significant asymptomatic testing program. So I wanna talk to you just a little bit about that. So we have not had a large number of COVID-19 cases up here in Houghton County. Uh, they have been increasing slowly, but really compared to the rest of the state and the rest of the area, we are very low. We recognize that there is a likelihood of people coming to our campus, bringing the virus to this area. It is essential that we catch the majority of those as early as possible. So we are asking you when you come to campus to join in our voluntary testing program. I can tell you, we are not using the very uncomfortable test that some of you may have had or some of you may have heard about. The test that we are using with our healthcare partner is not that bad. Um, and that's what the students tell me who've done it so far. So um, there's that important fact. And although we're not requiring it because we do believe very, very strongly here at Michigan Tech in um, personal choice, we also believe very strongly in individual responsibility. So we're asking you to join us in this effort so that as we bring everyone back to campus, we can get a strong baseline reading on the prevalence of COVID-19 among our population. And then we are going to have additional periodic samples throughout the remainder of the fall semester. And if we ask you to do that asymptomatic testing, we're hoping that you'll take us up on that and help us ensure that we are getting the numbers that the epidemiologists need to see to truly understand the health of our community. That's what will allow us to move among these levels and to move down to level two, a less restrictive level if that becomes appropriate. Or if we have to, if we find that we have a larger number of cases than we're anticipating, or perhaps that the COVID-19 virus becomes worse overall in the state, we may need to move up to level four and make those adjustments where we might see some more restrictions on common spaces or restrictions on visitors. We'd obviously rather go towards level two. Um, you know, we know, we know that this is a shift for you. Um, we know that we have a solid plan in place and we think we have the best plan in place for addressing this. And really it hinges on your participation. It hinges on you doing your part, wearing your face coverings, washing your hands, doing your daily symptom tracking. If you do develop symptoms, reporting those, entering the system and the process that we have in place to keep you and everyone else as health, healthy and safe as possible. So we're asking for your cooperation in that. We have the support measures in place to help you get through this. We have our isolation spaces set aside um, and we have the capacity to deal with this safely. So although we can't guarantee any results, I do think we have a very solid plan in place and we are really looking forward to your return. With that, I'm gonna pass this back to Larkin and she is going to um, moderate our Q&A session to answer some of the questions I know have been rolling in throughout our presentation today. Thank you. Great, thank you all. Like Sarah said, at this time, we'd like to open the session to your questions. Several of you have submitted questions in advance, so we'll get started with those. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible during the remainder of the hour. This first question will be directed to Jackie. When will we have notification on which classes are affected by remote online or online instruction and which classes are in person? Right, thanks Larkin. So if you go out and check your schedule, you can see what is happening in real time. So as the campus went through the process of reducing occupancy in rooms to correspond to that six foot physical distancing constraint, we worked from the largest classes down towards the smaller classes. So if you were in a large class, a 500 person class that was planned for Fisher 135, your class might have been one of the first ones that was 
moved to remote instruction or changed into a variety of sections. And you can see those things by going out right now, checking your course schedule. Um, if you have concerns or questions, the first place to go is to your academic advisor in your department. The second place to go is your department chair to find out more information and you, if you have questions about it. So as we go through this whole process, things have pretty much settled. They're pretty much set where they are right now. There probably will be a few more last minute adjustments between now and the start of fall semester, but we're, we're pretty good right now so you can go out and check right away. Thank you, Jackie. This next question will be directed to Sarah. What will happen if a student in the dorm tests positive? So if one of the students in residential housing tests positive, that student will be moved to one of our isolation spaces. Um, if that student has a roommate, that roommate will be um, quarantining for up to 14 days. And the health department has a key role in all of this and we'll be cooperating with them. Um, we do have support services to ensure that both students in isolation and in quarantine have food and other essential service um, items delivered to them. In addition, there will be contact tracing run both through the health department and through Michigan Tech to ensure that others who have been in close contact with a positive case are informed of that so that they can likewise quarantine. And depending on where the student has been, what their interactions have been, there may be some additional notifications made as well. So that's handled on an individual case by case basis, but that's an overall summary of what happens. Thank you. Our next question will go to Teresa. How will lecture halls such as Fisher 135 be adapted to meet the new spatial requirements? Okay, so our um, engineering group in facilities management went through all of our instructional spaces and assessed them for the new capacity um, to allow for the six foot distancing given the room size and the furniture configuration. So it was a room by room um, assessment. And this information was then used by the registrar's office to determine what classes were assigned to what spaces um, following up to the explanation that um, Jackie gave about um, which courses were moved to online or broken out into different sections and moving from largest to smallest. Thank you. Our next question will go to President Kovac. Last spring, Michigan Tech provided room and board refunds for unused portions of the semester. Are you planning to do the same thing if we are forced to go to remote instruction again? In addition, can you speak to the status of tuition for classes that are delivered online, please? Sure, Larkin. First, we hope we don't end up in that situation again, but I believe that you saw that we have plans in case we, in case we do. And just as last spring, if we get in that situation, there would be refunds for services that we are unable to render to you, such as housing and the experience tech fee. She also heard from Jackie, there's a number of variables that are coming into play with regard to the mode that the course is gonna be delivered. And we do not have plans for differential tuition as a function of delivery mode. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be going to Bonnie. If all classes end up being changed to remote or online, will students be allowed to get out of the housing contracts for the first semester or all year? Well, as Sarah indicated earlier, this is a really rapidly changing situation. And I think we would make our decisions in real time in the time frame that makes the most sense. So at this point, I would say that we'd be making our decisions for the fall semester only. Thank you. Our next question is going to be directed to Joe Cooper. In the event of having a full online semester, can Michigan Tech ensure students are not penalized for their scholarships if they choose to take a gap semester? That's a good question. So in general, we're not looking to penalize any students. I will say financial aid can often be complex. And so I would recommend if students have that concern or are thinking about that, which I know is a very personal decision 
for a student to make if they're considering that, contact the financial aid office to talk about, you know, what effects would there be? I can usually ensure that your Michigan Tech scholarships would be okay, but there may be certain things we have to look at with other scholarships, whether it be from federal or state sources. So please don't hesitate to contact us and we'll take a look at that. Thank you. This next question will be directed to Bonnie. Will there be any task forces to help off-campus students if they contract the virus? For example, will there be a good and service, food service um, for off-campus students if they have COVID-19 and are unable to go to local stores? That's a good question. We do not have task forces set up um, to support off-campus students in that way. Um, some of you might not realize that like some of the businesses in town now have curbside um, pickup. So if you have a friend perhaps who could pick up groceries for you, that would be one possibility and then they could leave it outside your door. Um, if that isn't feasible, um, you can contact the Dean of Students Office and we'll um, find some support and find some help for you. I do know also that the staff at the food pantry is talking about offering delivery. So that's another option that we'll be exploring. Great, thank you. This next question is for Jackie. How will physical education courses run for the next year so that students can still meet general education requirements? Thank you, Larkin. So um, the student development complex, for example, has been working over the summer to put in place all the safety protocols that have been um, subscribed by the state for gyms and most of the courses are ready to go. There are a few that there's still some bugs being worked out. So the plan right now is to offer a full set of physical education courses that will be available like usual to all students. And as we move into winter, of course, the number of winter related opportunities increases. And so there'll be some new things on the book as we start getting snow. Thanks. Thank you. I'll direct this next, next question to Sarah. How will contact tracing be accomplished? So some of the details are still being worked out at the state level regarding this, but this is what we know. The Western UP Health Department is our local health department. And when there is a positive case, they will do a direct interview with the individual who is positive. They also contact the close contacts of that individual to ensure that they are moved into quarantine. Um, depending on whether or not the individual has been on our campus, we are more or less involved in that process. Um, we do have some um, employees working from home and some students who uh, may be in the area but not on campus. So the process is a little bit different there. Um, if we do have people who are in specific areas on campus with other people with likely exposures, there are some additional notifications that happen in those areas as well. Um, so it is a case-by-case -case basis. We have um, some special software programming that we are working on for our contact tracing. We're also very closely connected with the Western UP Health Department and talking to them very regularly um, regarding contact tracing and other issues. Great, thank you. One more question for Teresa. Will the shuttle around town be available and as often as it was last year and will it still be a shared service with people in the community or just for tech students? Um, right, so transportation is important. Um, right now, for the fall, the university is planning to, again, contract with the city of Houghton for student ridership on a commuter shuttle. And that is a blended service that includes community members. Um, we're also planning to continue our campus circulation shuttle and a shopping shuttle for the fall. And those are Michigan Tech community specific routes. Um, for all of our shuttle services, uh, physical distancing will be part of the ridership experience and additional cleaning measures will be taken. And we have been continuing to operate our shopping shuttle this summer with those elements in place and it has been successful. Thank you. We will now move to questions that were submitted in our session today. The first one will go to Bonnie. What is the outlook for clubs and organizations on campus? Um, we expect the student 
um, organizations to function as normal. Um, you know, we will be giving them and sharing with them the guidelines um, as in terms of how to do that, but um, we expect that they'll be able to operate. Thank you. I'll be directing this next question to Jackie. How will faculty enforce face mask wearing? Right. So I think everyone has to recognize that this is a really stressful time in um, the history of mankind. Certainly none of us have been through a global pandemic before in our lives. So given that and, and given the need to function as a community that looks after one another, the first step is also to just ask for compliance. That's the easiest thing to do. And Michigan Tech students, staff, and faculty are great about trying to help one another out. So most of the time when you ask someone to do something that is for your own safety or the safety of others who are in the vicinity who might be at risk, you get compliance. However, if someone, say in a classroom, does not comply, for example, if a student refuses to wear a face covering and even after being asked, then the faculty member has every right to ask that student to leave the classroom because it's important to remember that they then are putting all the other students in the room at some risk. So the next step is to ask the person to leave. And if the student should, in fact, refuse to leave the classroom, then the faculty member has the right to end the class period. Um, so again, the ultimate goal here is protecting safety. If we protect safety, we can all come back together and have this face-to-face -face learning experience to the maximum extent possible. But if we let go of safety, we lose everything else. So it really has to be the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. This next question will be going to Teresa. Guidelines say that there should be 50 people at maximum in a room but you mentioned that Fisher 135 can hold 47 people. How did the 50 people maximum guideline come into play when considering Michigan Tech's room sizes? Right, so um, that maximum number only applies if that amount could be achieved while maintaining six foot physical distancing. So the approach that we took was to go through every space and identify what our um, capacities would be using that six foot physical distancing. Thank you. Jackie, this next question is for you. Some students have far more difficulty with learning remotely or online than they do in a normal classroom setting. What do you propose to make their learning experience easier? Right, that's a really good point. It's not the same to, remo to learn remotely or online. Um, when we talk to students and faculty after spring semester, the biggest issues that both students and faculty identified were either unfamiliarity with the technology or the inability to say, get good internet access or have dedicated space and time to do the work that they needed. And so um, if we're all back at the same place or if we all have our own device so that we can have dedicated access to the course, that overcomes one big hurdle. In addition, education is a science and we have a center for teaching and learning here on our campus. The staff members of that center have been working with faculty over the summer who had some specific challenges. Often they're working one-on-one -on -one with those faculty to figure out how to do a better job of meeting the needs of a diverse student population. And so I think we've all learned a lot over the summer. I've had some emails that have been shared with me from department chairs of faculty who took the training over the summer, who basically came back saying, I had no idea how much I didn't know until I started to learn more about how to do education in a 21st century environment, which necessarily involves the use of technology. So, um, you know, we're an institution of higher education. We value learning and we're learning what went well, what didn't went well, didn't go well, and doing things to overcome any shortcomings we saw in the spring. And we'll continue to do the same thing as we move into the fall. Thank you, Jackie. 
This next question is for Joe. Financial situations have changed a lot due to COVID-19. Who do we direct getting a review of our financial aid package to? Good question. And we understand that a lot of folks may be experiencing this. You can send an email to finaid at mtu.edu. In the subject line, you can put special circumstances or special review and tell us a little bit about what's going on. There's a, a kind of a strict process we have to follow that the federal government sets in place in order to review your expected family contribution that's set by the federal government. But by doing this process, it would allow us to see if you may be able to be considered for additional aid opportunities. Thank you, Joe. I'll be directing this next question to Sarah. What is the cost for the asymptomatic testing program, especially for uninsured or underinsured individuals? There is no cost to anyone obtaining a test for COVID-19 in the state of Michigan, and that's true for any testing through our university as well. Thank you. Jackie, a question for you. Will there be a possibility to limit the amount of back and forth to and from school related breaks, specifically around not returning potentially after Thanksgiving break, but finishing remotely? Right. So again, you know, as I said in my first remarks, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding the fall semester. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We have very few cases in Houghton County right now. I think in the entire county, when I looked yesterday, there were 24 positive cases and three probable cases. So on the order of 30, very low, that's great. Um, it's possible that will grow in the future. We don't know if that's gonna happen, it could happen. Should that happen or if there are other things going on that we can't even conceive of right now, we do have the opportunity to do many things. For example, we could completely cancel that mid-semester break in October and just tell students we're gonna continue classes or there'll be some other activities and we don't want you to leave. Similarly, it's possible we could cancel Thanksgiving break and ask students to stay. The outcome of both of those actions would be we would finish fall semester a little bit early and send everyone home for the winter break a little bit earlier, maybe a week earlier than planned. We also know that things could get bad, right? And so if they do get bad, we have the opportunity to break with the face-to-face -face instruction at that October break and send students home if they need to go home and then resume classes with very little interruption to the learning opportunities. And again, at Thanksgiving, if things look bad at Thanksgiving, we have the opportunity to move to remote instruction, fully remote instruction at that time. So we've really tried to think about fall semester in a series of chunks and we can respond to what's happening on the ground and around the planet in real time as we enter any of those breakpoints. And because of the, the rapidity at which circumstances are changing throughout this COVID-19 pandemic, we really need to maintain as much flexibility as we can so that we respond appropriately at the time we need to respond. So that's it. Thank you. This next question is for Sarah. Do we have to be COVID-19 tested to return to campus? No. In fact, what our epidemiologists and doctors are telling us is that there's not much value in getting a test before you get to the area. What we would rather you do is um, have a test when you arrive here as part of our testing program. That will do a better job of letting us know if you're infected at the time and we'll be able to address that right away. Um, if you are tested before you come, there's always a chance that you will be infected after that test is taken or that your viral load will increase after that test is taken. You'll still be infectious when you arrive here and you wouldn't know it. Thank you. This next question is for Jackie. Is the pass-fail system still in place for the fall 2020 semester? Good question. So at present, it is not. Um, that's one of those things that could change. We made that change during spring semester as a result of moving to remote instruction um, with zero warning. So it's not out of the question that it would be there, but it's not in place right now. Thank you. A question for Bonnie. 
What is your recommendation if a student is considered a high-risk individual but will be living off campus? Should they make arrangements to stay at home or should they still return? Mm. Well, I think that individual is probably going to need to make a personal decision um, given their health circumstances. They should also contact um, Student Disability Services um, to make arrangements to study remotely if they want to be in Houghton, but stay in their apartment. If they feel like that's an option that they would want to explore, they could certainly do that. Thank you. This next question is for Jackie. What will fall camp in Alberta look like? That's a great question, and I saw that one coming up um, a few times. So at this time, it's planned to be face-to-face. -face. And I heard today from Dr. Andrew Storr, who's the Dean of the College of Forest Resources and Environmental Sciences, that he will be doing a town hall like this one to talk about fall camp and other aspects of the college's instruction probably next week. So please look for um, probably an email announcement coming out from the college and then attend that town hall to find out more. So they're planning all the same sorts of distancing and housing capabilities as we'll he have here on main campus and he'll have all the details then. Thank you. Teresa, this question is for you. How will the changes to eating in the residence halls affect people who live off campus that eat in the residence halls, for example, people with top dog? Right, um, so it is our plan to accommodate anyone who has a meal plan. So top dog is one of our meal plans. Um, they should be able to either do dine in or take out um, as, as with anyone else who has a plan. So they will be accommodated. Thank you. For Sarah, could you please explain more about the isolation plan for students in residence halls? Will quarantine be in place with the roommate or will students be asked to move? And are you following the CDC's 10 day guideline for this? So, if you have a positive COVID-19 test, you individually who have that test will move to isolation. The roommate or roommates of that individual person would then be placed in quarantine. Those are um, both in line with CDC guidance. Moving out of isolation and moving out of quarantine are both health department decisions. Um, so right now our health department is following all CDC guidelines. When you move out of isolation depends on a variety of factors, including your personal symptoms. Um, so there may be a follow up test to determine when it's appropriate to move out of isolation or you may time out depending on which CDC um, strategy they are following at that point in time, which will be dependent often on your symptoms. If you are in quarantine right now CDC guidance, which our local health department is following is that you would be quarantined for 14 days. Uh, if you are, remain symptom free, then you are out of quarantine at the end of those 14 days. If you develop symptoms, um, then we would ask you to get a test. And if you choose to get a test, you would either move to isolation if positive or follow different guidelines if that's negative. So that's the, the process and it does follow all of the current CDC guidance. Thank you. This next question is for Bonnie. What concessions, if any, will be provided to students who test positive or need to self-quarantine due to someone close to them being positive to help them academically and to avoid falling behind or not being able to meet all course requirements? That's a great question. So our hope is that students who, <clears throat> excuse me, do test, posit <clears throat> do test positive are not so sick that they won't be able to continue their classes remotely. That's really the beauty of the work that the faculty has done is that students will be able to, to um, have opportunities to continue their work um, both online and remotely. If a student is sick and that's not possible, um, they would be given an, ex an equivalent to an excused absence. 
Um, and then what happens in normal circumstances is that a student and the faculty member work together to give a student the opportunity to make up missed work. Thank, Thank you. you, Bonnie. This next question is for Sarah. What is the difference between isolation and quarantine? Sure, and this is a common question. So isolation is what someone is in if they have had a positive test or if they're what's called by the health department a presumptive positive. Um, at quarantine is what close contacts of a positive person are put in and quarantine is generally those close contacts are people who've been closer than six feet for 15 minutes or more. And when you're in quarantine, you are avoiding contact with the outside world, but you do not necessarily have COVID. Thank you. Bonnie, this next question is for you. What about students with ADD or ADHD, OCD, anxiety, and other mental illnesses that will affect their performance with online learning? Are there going to be any accommodations made for them and specifically their needs? Certainly, again, students in those situations would work with um, student disability services to determine what kind of accommodation is most appropriate for their disability. Thank you. Jackie, this question will be directed to you. What monitoring is Michigan Tech doing for quality instruction? Right, so the Senate, the University Senate has a policy regarding the quality of instruction and 50% of that measure of any individual instructor's quality has to come from some source other than student evaluation of instruction. So students do um, fill out a form, give feedback to their instructors after every course, but in addition, faculty members are going through other types of, it's not really review, but it's more a professional learning environment for faculty that are working together to help each other improve. So it might be they work with a colleague to have the colleague come in and watch them teach a particular lesson or series of lessons and then give them feedback about how they might make it more effective. Or they might invite a member of our Center for Teaching and Learning to come in. Um, we do engage directly with faculty, not me personally, but usually the department chair will engage directly with faculty who seem to be struggling. And we find out about faculty who are struggling either from their students who report to the department chair that there seems to be a problem or through those surveys that are distributed to students at the end of each semester. So when a faculty member receives a number of um, fairly low ratings from students in their course, what my office does is then ask the Center for Teaching and Learning to reach out to those faculty members or have the faculty members reach out to others and come up with a plan for improvement. So those plans for improvement are submitted either to the Center for Teaching and Learning or to my office. We track, we make sure that in every semester, all of those are addressed, and then we monitor things as time goes on. And so, uh, you know, the obvious question is, does this actually result in improvements? And the answer is yes, it does. Thank you, Jackie. This next question is for Bonnie. Are parents or guests allowed on campus for move-in of new students into the dorms? Great question, yes. Um, we are asking um, families to limit um, the number of people that come with their student to two. Um, and then, as Sarah mentioned, those visitors will also be asked to do the um, guest symptom monitoring and that that will be available to them um, several hours before they come to campus. Thank you. This next question is for Sarah. Will there be parameters for face coverings such as windshields in, or face shields, excuse me, in lieu of masks? So generally we are asking um, individuals to wear face coverings. If they are not able to medically tolerate a face covering, accommodations are available for that. In some cases that may be a face shield. 
Um, it may be a different accommodation as well. So if you're in a situation where you're not medically able to tolerate a face covering, which could be a face mask, it could be a buff pulled over the face, um, reach out to Student Disability Services and see if an accommodation might be more appropriate for you. Thank you. Jackie, this next question is for you. Will the learning centers be open this fall? And if so, how will they operate? Yeah, so the learning centers will be open this fall and they will probably be open by appointment in most cases to a smaller number of students that won't be just walk in necessarily. You may need to make an appointment so that we don't have crowding in those facilities. And also during spring semester, the learning centers continue to operate so they can also use remote technology like we're doing right here if needed to meet with students. Thank you. Bonnie, this next question is for you. Is there a limit to the number of students allowed in a dorm room, specifically regarding guests? And will this be monitored? Um, yes. So we have said that um, the number of guests cannot exceed the number of people in the room. So you could have two, two guests in your room at a time. Um, I, I can't say that there are going to be people going around and knocking on every door to say how many people are in this room, but we do have staff that does rounds on a regular basis. And I think if they noticed that there were more than people in a room than should be, they would address that. Thank you. This next question is for Sarah. Could you please talk about how you're communicating with the local health care providers and the health department? So I, I, my answer to this would depend a little bit on what about. Um, so we're in very regular communication uh, with the local health department regarding active cases in the area, if there are any positive cases tied to us, how they feel about the protocols that we are drafting up and proposing to put in place. Um, we're talking to them about state guidance regarding communications between local universities and health departments. Um, we have a close relationship there. We are in regular phone, Zoom, text contact with individuals there. The same is true with local healthcare providers. Um, I know Dr. Kobeck has talked and has spoken with the local health care providers within the last week. We also have very regular contact um, with Upper Great Lakes, who we've been partnering with, has been having a drive through testing clinic on our campus over the summer, and we're working with them on move in testing and baseline testing when everyone comes back to campus. Um, so that's also Zoom phone calls, text messages um, as issues arise. Great. Thank you, Sarah. This next question is for Joe. For students who cannot afford a personal laptop for their remote or online classes, will there be accommodations for them and what would these be? Sure, good question. So um, yes, there is the option if you do find yourself in that situation, you can contact financial aid to request a cost of attendance adjustment. That's something we can look at. Um, in most cases, this will give you additional student loan eligibility, but again, each case would be looked at individually to see what your situation is. Thank you. This question is for Bonnie. How can parents receive more information on this as well as other general student life topics in the future? Not sure exactly um, what they mean. Um, President Kobeck does a letter to um, parents and families on a quarterly basis and covers a variety of different topics um, like that. We do send our, we have been sending our communications um, about COVID to um, students, but then also they've been forwarded to parents for informational purposes as well. So that's um, been happening around COVID and I imagine we'll continue that until the fall as well. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is for Sarah. Will any student who wants a COVID-19 test be able to get one? Yes, absolutely. Tests are available essentially on demand right now. And as long as the test supply remains strong, which we expect it to, anyone can get a test at any time. Thank you. And a follow-up question to that, who should be contacted about that? 
So there will be, there is an MTU Flex portal that students will be using this fall. This is where they'll be doing their symptom tractor. They'll also be able to report test results there. And they'll also have information there, um, I believe, on how to access tests. It's also on the MTU Flex website. If you um, go to the COVID-19 testing, you'll see testing statistics that are live for our campus community. And there's a, a button there as well that I believe takes you to local test sites throughout Michigan, including here um, in the Houghton area. Thank you. Bonnie, this next question is for you. What is happening to career services or water a center? So both of those offices will be open um, as normal and following physical distancing guidelines. Um, and we'll be doing coaching much like Jackie referenced for the learning centers um, in the water a center. And um, they're right now working hard on orientation um, and orientation will be a blended mix of in-person activities and um, online and remote activities as well. And the same applies for career services. Um, the staff is coming back and um, are putting together a lot of workshops. Again, the, there may be some size um, constraints when those workshops are offered. So they'll be offering them more often and or they'll be offering them virtually as well. And the career fair itself, as I mentioned, will be virtual. Thank you, Bonnie. This next question is for Sarah. If I am hypothetically walking around campus or downtown Houghton with my roommate, are we expected to socially distance from each other? So CDC guidance would say that if you and your roommate are living in the same space, you're considered a family unit and you don't need to physically six foot distance from people within your same family unit. Uh, depending on what you're doing, you may be expected to physically distance um, from others, certainly, but you and your roommate living in the same space don't need to distance from each other. Thank you, Sarah. This next question is for Teresa. Can you please explain the electronic dining sign up? And specifically, do you have to report to the dining hall at the same time every day? And as a follow up question, are mil meals able to be delivered to your room in lieu of dining? Um, sure. So I'll, I'll start with the second half of the question is we don't have a plan to deliver meals to student rooms um, unless they're in isolation and then we are fully prepared to serve that need. Um, the electronic sign up, um, we experimented with that in the spring, and that is to quickly get people through the process of going through the dining hall. So um, in this, for the takeout meals, you're able to sign up for what you want, approximately when you're going to pick it up, and we'll have it packaged and ready to go to get you in and out really quickly. Um, for the in-house dining, we're developing that platform right now and it's likely that we will have time slots where students could choose to sign up. It would not be necessarily mandatory, but it will be the best way for us to manage our in-house seating and it, we would not have a, a sign up that would um, would require you to be at the same time every day because we know that schedules are quite variable and students have different um, activities and responsibilities on different days of the week. So we want to maintain as flex as much flexibility as possible. Thank you. Bonnie, this next question will be for you. Is family weekend still happening in October? It is not. Um, again, the, the, the thinking is we don't want to bring people that have potentially been exposed back into the area. Um, we are trying to um, evaluate what kinds of virtual events we might be able to offer students and their families in place of that. Thank you. Sarah, this next question will be for you. Will students flying out of country on a break be expected to quarantine upon return? We're following CDC guidance on this. Right now, CDC guidance is that anyone who is doing international travel quarantine for 14 days upon return to the United States. So right now the answer to that is yes. If that guidance were to change, we would probably change along with it. Thank you. 
Jackie, this next question is for you. What will final exams look like? So that's a really good question. If they're face-to-face -face on campus, they'll probably look a lot like they have always looked. Um, if we're fully remote, they will look a lot more like how they looked at the end of spring semester. So um, I've been working actually a lot with our Center for Teaching and Learning about tests, assessments, quizzes. And one thing that we have all learned since COVID-19 came into our lives is that the way most of us gauge student learning is probably not the most effective way. So multiple choice tests are probably not the best way to measure whether or not a student has actually learned the material and can apply it to new situations. So again, the Center for Teaching and Learning is working with faculty across campus to think about more ways to do different types of assessments, many more formative or low stakes assessments that become a learning opportunity on their own, and fewer of those high stakes assessments that we've all seen so much in the past. So it, it continues to evolve. Um, for those instructors who do want to continue to use those sort of traditional high stakes assessments, there are ways we can do it either in person, having proctors in the room, or doing it remotely using technology. We use Respondus Monitor here at Michigan Tech or simply monitoring the course as they're taking the, the test through camera, like we can see each other here, at least some of us can see each other right now. Um, so there's a lot of uh, opportunities available and instructors have a lot of latitude to choose the method that works best for their students in their course. So we're not prescribing it at the university level. Thank you, Jackie. We have time for a couple more questions. So our next one is for Bonnie. Will there be significant restrictions on student organizations in booking rooms on campus for meetings and other events? Well, I think again, um, the space restrictions are going to apply um, based on capacity and, and number of people able to be together. Um, the rooms, we, we know that we have, we're holding some of the rooms in the MUB right now for um, space should students need a, a place to do um, some remote classes um, while they're on campus. So that might reduce the amount of available space in the MUB during the day. Um, I would envision that if student orgs are using classroom space in the evenings for their club meetings and events, that those spaces would be available as usual. Thank you, Bonnie. Teresa, I have a dual question for you. Um, the first one, they're both quite important, but the first one is, will the restrooms that are closed off currently be reopening? And the second one is, will the ski hill open? Yes, both of those are very important questions, I agree. Um, very soon we do have a plan to reopen the restrooms on campus that are currently closed. The reason for that closure is for us to redirect the custodial staff's effort um, to other important matters, um, but we will be reopening those very soon. Um, and our plan right now is to have a really successful ski season this winter. Great, thank you. This will be our last question this afternoon, and it is for Bonnie. Please tell me, I'll be able to hear the sweet sounds of the Michigan Tech pep band this year. Yes, you will. Um, I, I really want to give a shout out to the pep band because they were one of the first groups that came forward and asked about um, planning how to run band camp, which they usually do um, at the end of orientation week in a responsible way so that they could physically distance. Um, they've been paying attention to um, the literature in terms of aerosols and instruments and, and use of um, mouthpieces and things like that. Um, we've been talking to them. They're working with the department. So they may not all be so close together, but I think we'll still hear their sound. Thank you, Bonnie. I think we're all looking forward to hearing the sweet, sweet sounds of pep band. I agree. Again, that was the last question. Thank you again for joining us today. As I mentioned at the beginning of the town hall, 
This session has been recorded and will be available on our Michigan Tech Flex webpage on Monday. If you have additional questions, feel free to connect with us using the email address you will see on the screen shortly. Again, thank you so much for joining and we look forward to seeing you on campus soon.